big thing that this is giving to us in this class so far, and we'll really emphasize it today, is there are real problems that uh, come up that statics can't solve because it just doesn't have enough equations. There's just too little known. Uh, that's why whenever we had statics problem, we always had a roller at one end of those beams because if we didn't have a roller there, then there's too many unknowns, not enough equations, and there's nothing we could do. This class is, a, in a sense, bringing up more equations for us, allowing us to use more equations to do more problems. For example, if we have uh, maybe some kind of uh, support piece or something that's made up that's uh, made up of two different materials. One is a tube made up of one material. So it would have its own um, modulus of elasticity. And I happen to call that material two, so I'll go ahead and label this one two. But then inside, there's another material. Uh, so maybe not as a, a support piece of any kind, um, but some kind of uh, piece under some of these structural loads that we, that we see in a lot of these problems. And um, let's additionally say uh, that the bond between the two, there's either a small gap, so they're not really in contact, or there's no adhesive in any kind. That way, as, as one changes length, the other can change freely depending on the loads itself. There's not extra forces, uh, shear forces, available at the interface between the two materials. You probably wouldn't want to do that anyway uh, for thermal expansion problems um, so that as one heats up and expands differently than the other one, they won't bind on each other, which would cause uh, tremendous uh, uh, residual shear forces. So, uh, so we'll just say that the bond between the two is, is slippery. There's no adhesive. They're not press fit. They're not uh, fit while the outer one's warm and then allowed to cool and shrink down into a tight fit or any of those type of things. It just simply slips in and is very loose. So, if we look at this then in, in cross section and then uh, add some kind of loading, and we'll, we'll put a rigid plate there and a rigid support of some kind there, and then apply some kind of load to that. And we want to figure out. Uh, what the reactions are going to be, what are the stresses in the materials themselves going to be. Just to highlight, there's the inside material. Okay, so like a, like a, I don't know what, a, a hostess ding dong? What, there's, there's some chocolate cookie thing that's kind of like this. It's a, you know, a chocolate thing with cream filling. Swiss roll. Swiss roll. Did you know when I first asked that question, I was looking right at you, anticipating you'd know the answer. So, so there. So we have a, a chocolate cake with a, a with a cream filling as our support, as our uh, our structural member here, and we want to figure out. That's assuming, of course, we know the uh, the minus elasticity of whipped cream, which I, I bet is on the internet. So if we break this apart into our little pieces, we've got this load here on this plate. And then resisting that are two loads, uh, two, two reactions, one from the inside piece, uh, allowing some kind of support. So I'll call that uh, P1, maybe. And then one from the outside piece, uh, Maybe I'll draw that kind of like this. And those two things together are P2. Just to remind us that that's a, a tube 
but that, that force is resisted all the way around and of course, uh, as we already know, has to do with the area of these two pieces as well as a factor, especially when we're looking at the stress. So that P2 is actually the force all the way around the contact ring of the two. Uh, but I gotta, I gotta draw it some way, so I'll draw it like that for you. And then, uh, then we can look at the individual pieces. So here's the two in cross section, and it's of course uh, withstanding that much, and. We know that that's also going to be the reaction down here. And then the inner part itself is, uh, that's P1, right? Okay, so there's, there's the setup. But all we can do with it in statics is really this piece right here. All we can say is that P must equal P1 plus P2. However much force is the total load is split somehow between the tube and the filling. And that's, that's static. We couldn't do any moment equation, mo moment balance. Why couldn't we do a moment balance on this? You know, presume, presume we, we knew the radius of the, uh, of the tube so we'd know where those are. Why couldn't we do a moment balance and have it help? Because that's always, when we did, you know, there's our force balance. We can't do two force balances because we don't have any forces in the x direction, so it wouldn't help to sum the forces in the x direction. Why can't we do a moment balance, though? For a, for a, we need, we got two unknowns, we only need one more equation. Why don't we just do a, for, a moment balance? No moment. Well, there's, there's, this force is applying a moment about that point, and those forces about any other point on there. There's moments being applied. But because of two things, well, they're kind of interconnected. Because of the symmetry, then all of those moments are going to be identically balanced anyway. Plus, all of the forces are parallel. So remember uh, uh, the kind of thing when we were looking at a three-force member in statics. We had to have all those forces cross at some point, and then there was a moment about that point. If they're all par parallel, there is no such point. So uh, we can't do a force balance. We need some other equation. Two unknowns, one equation. We're just one short equation. So we use the things that we've got now in this term, the deformation of the pieces. We'd have to assume that the two pieces would deform by the same amount. You can't have that force squishing the two pieces and have one of them squish farther than the other one would. What would there? What is this? No, that's the little delta force or at an angle or off center. Well, yeah, but that's not the case. You can't change the problem to your own liking. That's not fair. You can't come in and say it's not a Swiss roll. It's a I don't know something else. Yeah, Twinkie. Twink yeah, Twinkies. Twinkies can withstand anything. So, uh, so we assume that, uh, well, we don't assume, it just couldn't be any other way. It couldn't possibly be that the tube would deflect down to here, but the inner part would keep going, and vice versa. They have to go the same amount. So, whatever that deflection is, and of course, greatly exaggerated in my little picture. It's got to be the same for the two of them. 
And that allows us more equations then. Uh, del equals del 1 equals del 2, where again the 1 and the 2 are for the two different parts of the structure. 1, the inner, 2, the tube, or tube part. And then those we can uh, just put into there. Actually, the, the length of each is the same, so I don't need a subscript on that. Whatever the two material properties are, both uh, the geometry of the part, the L and the A, and the material property, the E, And that's just setting the deflection of the to the deformation of the two to be equal. And with that and this, then we have two equations, two unknowns. And we can solve the problem. I'll just give it to you. We're going to go through the algebra of this. That's not the point of this class. It's the, uh, oh, no, that's... P2. Yeah. No, no, it's got a, it's P itself. Yeah, P itself. The, the, uh, the original load over E1, A1 plus E2, A2. And then the, uh, the, the uh, P2 looks just the same, only these top two... Uh, indices are changed to a 2. Yeah, we, we have no minus signs in there. And then once those are known, uh, just put those over the individual areas. And we also know the stress. And then we can design it to avoid maximum stress and, and life. But the whole thing comes down to this additional piece of information now that we can apply from this course that we didn't have in statics. So we can now solve problems that last fall would have been statically indeterminate, meaning there's more unknowns than, solute, than equations. Now we have more equations to bring into the problem. And those are the things we'll use uh, for, for, at least for this section of problems, statically indeterminate problems that we'll use to solve them, to solve problems we couldn't have done last fall. David. Now this thing could be now this kind of, so now this method could be applied to say something like reinforced concrete, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Very any any time you have two dissimilar materials that must undergo the same deflection, you you could yeah. We're going to. Uh, um, I don't. Remember that we very often look at reinforced concrete problems in compression. Yeah. We look at them yeah. in bending, oh, where, right. where we have reinforced concrete beams yeah. with transverse loads. We're still looking at axial loads here. Yeah. Um, but no reason that this couldn't have been cement with like a rebar filling. Like Wouldn't attention. taste very good. Travis would eat it anyway. But. All right. Uh, so let's try a couple more problems uh, and other types of solutions. This is simply, uh, so I don't know, there's not a real particular name for this other than uh, just using the fact that these, the uh, two pieces must have the same deflection. But there's other types of problems that we can solve with this. So imagine a one material beam or support structure of some kind, whatever it might be, between rigid supports. And at some point in between, is an intermediate load. So we'll say
say, we'll say that's at uh, some distance down from the top. And then the rest of it we'll just call L2. So some intermediate place, there's some kind of load. This could be a uh, column that goes through more than one floor of a building, and this <coughs> load is one of the floors that's tied to that column. It's not uncommon for, for support beams, support posts, to go uh, through several parts. All right, just for reference sake, we'll call the top there A, the bottom B, and the intermediate point C. And so what we're looking for in this are the reactions at the outside part. So if that's some load P, we have some kind of reaction up at A, some kind of reaction down at B um, may or may not be uh, both in compression. Doesn't matter because uh, we're going to find them anyway and we'll get the appropriate signs through the solution. So all we can do with our statics part, in fact, let me turn it around just so it makes a little bit more sense. I guess we would expect this one to be that kind of reaction. Um, all we can say here is that P equals RA minus RB, I guess we'd say since they're actually they're in the same direction. That's why I made it better, because then I can have a plus sign there. So that's our full statics analysis. We can't do anything more with it. There is no moments because it's a purely axial problem. We just don't have uh, enough going for us here to add any more. So, what are we to do? Um, well, well, now we pull in again uh, the possibility of some kind of deformation. Loaded as shown, we'd expect maybe L1 would get greater because of the uh, orientation of P being down. We'd expect L1 to stretch a little bit, and then of course L2 must compress by, in fact, the same amount, because remember I said these are rigid supports. When we say rigid supports, that means that the distance between them does not change. The kind of thing where if, we, if this was a support column driven down to bedrock, uh, we'd expect that the support at the bedrock would not, um, would not move. We would certainly want to look at the bearing stress, if you remember that, but it would not move. So we'd, uh, we'd expect that uh, del 1, however much the upper part might stretch, would be equal and opposite to del 2, where 1 is the upper material or the upper part of the beam above the load, 2 is the lower part below the load. So we'd expect that those two um, then would be our equations. As long as we don't bring in too many more unknowns here, we're going to be okay. So we'll take the second equation and make it, let's see, P1L1 over, I'll just say EA because there's no, uh, no difference in the material itself, the same cross-sectional area and made of the same material anyway, must equal P2L2 over, again, EA. Well, uh, without having a solution yet, one thing that's interesting is whatever the solution we get, it's the same no matter what the material or the cross-sectional area. But those two do not factor into it. And so now we can 
Uh, well, we're a little bit troubled. This P1, remember, is the force in the interior of the material. P2 is the force in the lower part. So we sort of have to uh, do something to figure out what those things are. So what we'll do is we'll again make one of our classic imaginary cuts, but we'll make it just shy of So this is uh, here one of our imaginary cuts. So I tend to make those a little wiggly, so we realize it's not really a structural cut. To do that exposes this P1 that's doing the stretching, and we see well that's no trouble. It must be equal to the reaction. So we haven't really introduced a new unknown. We just hadn't made sure what it was yet. So P1 is really RA, and P2 is really RB. And they themselves then differ by the amount of P from the force balance, and now we can solve the rest of the problem. Again, it's just algebra left now. So I'll put it out for you. P L2. Interesting that the reaction at A depends upon the length at 2 over the original length and RB is uh, very much the same only with the indices changed. P L1 over L where L remember is the entire length of the piece. P is the intermediate load whatever that might be and then L2 and L1 themselves actually locate the load. Oh, we don't need to do the timer today. I think we fixed the software. So you're fired. We thank you. Good service. Pick up your gold watch on the way out. We'll see. We'll see what? Whether this taping's fixed? Yeah. Or whether I'm sure you thought that has been fixed before. No, no, I checked it. We, we ran a test pri uh, Monday. I let the whole class tape that on Monday, Monday afternoon. All right, so uh, again, the whole secret, the whole help here that gets us beyond what we could have done in the fall is the fact that we can use the deformation <coughs> themselves somehow. And again, I think it's interesting that the material itself, even the width, the, the cross-sectional area of the piece doesn't make any difference doesn't even show up in the solution. So this is valid for uh, you know, some support beam or for whatever might be on uh, Travis's uh, dinner plate. It would all be the same solution. So Travis, you'll test that for us at, at dinner tonight. Okay, so again, we have to look at the geometry of the deformation, bring that in to get our additional equations. Okay, our next step with this. Um, this was convenient in that the cross-sectional areas were the same, but that might not necessarily be so. But there's another technique we can use, again, to find the reactions called superposition. Superposition is where we take the problem, break it into two problems we can solve that when added together give us the solution to the problem we can't solve. So. Again, imagine between two rigid supports, we want to find the reactions there. We have something, uh, something like this. Some kind of support structure where midway down, the cross-sectional area changes. And we'll actually put some numbers to this one. So it's 
right in the middle where we have this area change. And uh, two intermediate loads. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not 150. It's, we have two intermediate loads. Those are at 150 millimeters. something like this, all dimensions in millimeters, locates the middle of each section where we have two intermediate loads. Yeah, that's the picture we've got. So something like this, we'll put 300 kilonewtons there, and 600 kilonewtons there. So could be, a, again, a, a well, it's a little short for uh, some kind of uh, building structure, but uh, <coughs> something that requires uh, uh, a support piece with two different cross-sectional areas and two intermediate loads, and we want to find the reactions at the uh, different spots. So, again, we'll turn that A, middle piece C there. That's B, and some areas two hundred and fifty square millimeters, and don't confuse the area A for the index location A. I don't want to make this too easy. Four hundred. Superposition solution is going to look something like this. Here's the problem we want to solve, but can't. We have this we have this uh, loaded piece, and we want to find the reactions at the rigid supports. Oh, actually, what will, oh yeah, this one's RB. We're going to uh, leave this. We can, we can do the same problem twice. To, we, we can't find both reactions at once. Well, once we find the bottom reaction, then we can find the top reaction. Uh, but what we're going to do is uh, leave it like this. So we're going to break this into two other solutions. So this solution that we need to find here will be equivalent to two other parts that we can do. This we can't do because it's indeterminate, but we can do this. We can do this problem. <coughs> where the top doesn't move at all, because it's a rigid support there. We have two intermediate loads, and we've removed this, we've imaginarily removed that, and, uh, what did I call it? L. We can use that, we can determine what, what the deformation of the part would be without that bottom rigid support. So that's not the solution we're looking for, 
But if we take that solution, this we can find, and if we add to it, this solution that we can also find, find this solution where we find what force would be required to cause the piece to deform back to its original. Those two solutions superimposed over each other give us this original, the original situation we we're looking for that we could not solve. And this is the superposition, superimposing two solutions we can do over each other to get a solution we couldn't do in the original situation. Once we then find RB from this last step, then, uh, it's, uh, uh, then we can use statics to find out what RA is, the reaction at the upper part. So we imagine taking away the lower rigid support, allowing the piece to deform, calculate that deformation, then remove the loads and calculate what, reforce, what force would require us, be required to return the deformed solid to its original length. In other words, I guess, Del L plus del R equals zero. See the picture? Travis, you're frowning. You're just thinking of chocolate <coughs> or whatever they are. All right, because this this we've done. We did this. Uh, I think Monday we did one of these type of problems. Um, I can't remember, it may have been on its side, may not have. <coughs> but that type of problem we can do. We need to find out how the different sections each deform. We have four sections. Uh, anywhere we have a change in area and or an added load, <coughs> we consider that to be a different section. So. We have four sections, one down to the load, then down to the change in area, and then we have three, section three and section four. And on this uh, piece then, del L <coughs> will equal those four deformations, the, the four different sections, how much they deform, all added up. All right, so by whatever means we get all those sections, <clears throat> for example, uh, if we look at this bottom piece, piece four for this intermediate solution now, that's the one we're working on, where we've removed the support and imagine what the deformation <coughs> would be. We see piece four here, once we imagine the, the support removed, is unloaded. So we go to the, the next section. Uh, actually up into the piece a little bit in our imaginary cut. 
because we've got the 600 kilonewton load now. We've gone a little bit past it into section three. I did start from the bottom because that was the easy part. There's no load there. That was the easy one to do. So we know that this uh, upper part must be in tension. Oh, wait a second. That drawing didn't work. I went up one line too many. Here's. There's the load there. So this will be the, the force in section three. We need we know to be 600 kilonewtons, and we expect section three to elongate. So. Uh, uh, del 4 is 0 because, remember we're doing this artificial intermediate solution. There's no load on the bottom uh, all the way through section 4. Del 3 is the load there, which we now know to be the 600 kilonewtons times the length of 3 over E and A. E, we assume it's all, or it's, it, we're given that it's all one material, and A is this cross-sectional area here, this, this 400 <coughs> millimeters. So we've got all those pieces, 600 kilonewtons, the length is 150 millimeters, E, I don't know if I had one for whatever material I was. Oh, I'm going to just leave <coughs> that. Then we can just put it in once. 400 millimeters squared for this area. That's how much in this artificial intermediate solution here we would expect section 3 to stretch with these two kinds of loads and no load at the bottom. Remember, we're going to put that back in to recover this total deformation. All right, I think, no, naturally I don't have that piece written down. I've got just the final answer. So we'll go to the next section, put an imaginary cut here in section two. Got this 600 kilonewton load in the bottom part. We haven't quite gotten up to this load of 300 yet, so it's not there. So this part is also in tension at 600 kilonewtons. So now we can figure out how much that section will stretch. That's 2, del 2 equals P2L2 E over A2, which are most of the same numbers except the area has changed to what? 250. leaving off the units there because we've already got them. We're already going to have to check them. We've got all the pieces. And so that's how much deformation we'd expect in this second section here. And then for the third section, we make an imaginary cut. I guess it's the first section now. Put an imaginary cut. 
we've now got all the loads back in. And we know then this is P1. The force in the first, the top section, has got to hold these two loads, 900. And so we know then that del 1 is P1 L1 over E A1, which is 900 kilonewtons stretching 150 millimeters over E and the cross-sectional area is the 250. <coughs> okay, all the units are the same, so they're going to only have to check them once. All of those added up are going to give us this total deformation of the piece in this imaginary intermediate loading. Then we're going, oh, over here, this one, this imaginary intermediate loading. Then we're going to find out what force is required to recover that back to the undeformed state that was required because of the rigid supports. And that will be our reaction at the bottom support. So all of these added up come out to be 1.1 with all the units checked 1.129 times 10 to the ninth meters divided by E whatever the material is that's all of those uh, all those pieces no deformation in the bottom piece it was unloaded That'll stretch a bit, that'll stretch a bit, and that'll stretch a bit, and we add them all up. So we know that this is uh, the amount that the piece would stretch if the bottom support was removed. That's just like a, a couple problems we did. The, um, I think Monday we did one, and we did one the week before as well. Okay, I need some board space because now we need to imagine that the loads are removed and all we want to find is what force would be required to return us to our undeformed state as required by the original rigid supports. All right, so I need, I need more boards. All right, everybody okay with this if we got this down? Bill? Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, at least put up that one little piece we just calculated. Uh, we'll put it right here with this. One point one two nine times ten to the ninth meters. Actually, that's the units on the whole thing is meters. <laughs> that's already got the units of E in there. The whole thing is meters. All right. Now we need to do this little piece here, the superimposed piece. I guess we need we need again some imaginary cuts because the area change. So we have this RB we can't find yet. We're looking for it. That must be how much is in that section. So, maybe if we just simply number those one and two. So, 
del 1 will be R B L 1, the entire length of that section now, which is 300 millimeters, over E A A1. Or again, these numbers refer, maybe that's not helpful. Let's do this. We have four sections here. Let's call this then sections five and six. So we don't have any confusion with our indices. We don't have any confusion with these indices we had over on these other ones. Oh, so that's del five. Again, we don't know what RB is, but when we combine these together and compare these two artificial deformations we're imagining, RB will be uh, the outcome of it. Uh, do I have all the pieces for that put together? Oh, not quite. And then imagine a cut somewhere in section 6, as I called it. Again, we just see that, that section in tension under RB. That's supposed to be. Huh? That one I think is supposed to go down, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. So used to drawing things in tension. Thank you, David. And that then becomes that piece deformed uh, to the tune of, again, there's an RV in there, L6 over E, A6, because this whole top section is a different cross sectional area. <coughs> and those two added together is this total deformation del R2, which we uh, no, is the opposite of this. So del R is those two things added together, del 5 plus del 6. And with all the numbers and the geometry and everything else I can put in there for you, we get a minus 1.95 times 10 to the third, RB over E, and it all has units of meters. That includes the units already on RB and E. Everything's been checked to that point. superposition solution that's required, we know that these must be equal and opposite. So del 1 equals minus del R. Remember, this is the imaginary elongation from the first part. This is the imaginary compression from the second part. We put the two over each other, and we're going to get our full solution with no deformation because of the rigid uh, supports and we'll know the reaction at that bottom support. So the opposite of that thing, we lose the minus sign. We have RB over E, and the units have all been checked. That's just this thing rewritten up there. Notice what interesting thing happens once again. This solution is not at all dependent upon the material. That cancels out. And so we get a final notion that the only unknown now is that RB, because the E canceled, even though I hadn't given it to you. 
577 kilonewtons. Now that that's known, then it's uh, a trivial matter from what we would have done in the fall. Well, actually, physics one, they could have done it. You can figure out what RA is. And it's just got to be the difference between those and, and the loads that are imposed. So it becomes 323 kilonewtons. So the superposition. We have a, a problem that was statically indeterminate. Because of these rigid supports, there's no way we could have used statics last fall to figure out what the loads were, the reactions were at these two supports. So we imagine removing one of the supports, allowing the piece to deform because of the loads, and then figure out what force would be required to return that to its undeformed state, which would then give us the solution we had and we can solve the whole problem that way. That we couldn't have done last fall because last fall we didn't know anything about the material responses to these loads. We just assumed that uh, everything was rigid and did not deform. Questions on that? We can also use it for uh, a similar type of problem. Imagine we had exactly the same piece that we uh, understand now is in, in tension throughout the whole piece. Because uh, this part was positive, we had to bring it back. What if we build in a, uh, a pre-gap before loaded so that once it is loaded then it will deform down to the rigid solid but the reaction there will be less because some of the force is going to actually truly elongate the solid in this sense, or in this case, but um, not all of it. So the RB would redu be reduced, RA of course would have to go up a little bit, but it might balance the two a little bit more. So you should, uh, you should be able to find, imagine uh, that this pre-gap is uh, say 4.5 millimeters. And uh, this still holds, it's just the uh, intermediate part here, this will be greater than the 4.5 millimeters, so you'll have to recover a little bit of it, but with a much smaller uh, RB. And in this case then, you get a reaction at the bottom of 115. Kilonewtons significantly less than it was before, which may or may not be uh, the purpose of this gap. It could be just the gap is necessarily to even install the piece. And then RA increases because we still have the same support load required, increases to about 785 in this case. So it may be that's. Uh, purposely put in, maybe that's required just to get the piece in there. They have to fit these things together before they load them. So you can you can go through the superposition problem and see if you come up with that same thing. The first part here shouldn't change any. Then the second part you have del r, but you don't have to recover the entire. Uh, elongation from the first part, all the 4.5 millimeters of it.
So there's there's something to keep you awake on the weekend. In other words, del delta L plus delta R is 4.5 millimeters. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's try it with another type of problem. What was that? Is that you? That was you? Oh. Do you guys have a question? What? So is this a concern or something we're not supposed to do or is this No, you you we're not gonna do it now. That's something you you should be able to do yourself using what we had before. It's just uh, there's already a pre-gap in there that you don't have to recover with the reaction load. That's why the reaction load is so much smaller. <coughs> Instead of bringing it all the way back, you only have to bring it part way back because 4.5 millimeters uh, is, is left in there. That, of course, means there's some residual strain in there that may not have been before, but not necessarily a problem. All right, so here's uh, a different type of problem. This is not a superposition problem. Imagine we have a beam we're supporting with three struts. A, B, and C, evenly spaced. All the same length. So we can call this one A, B, and C. Rigid support at the top. And a load on the bottom bar. of uh, 220 kilonewtons. Now, the uh, difference being here that the bars are not of the same material. So bars A and C are made with something with an elastic modulus of 70 gigapascals and a cross-sectional area of 550 millimeters squared. What? Oh, you want to know what it is? It might be. Could be um, a baked whipped cream. Or, you know, if you go get uh, something out of uh, Travis's trunk that's been in there for a while, God knows what it is now. RC, uh, 200 gigapascals. May or may not be that material, just happens to have the same modulus of elasticity. And RC has a cross-sectional area of 900 square millimeters. No, bars A and C have that. Oh, sorry. <coughs> That's B, the middle bar. Bar B sounds like a cattle brand. Huh, Samantha? She's the only one that understands my cowboy references. God bless her. Okay, we want to find the supports, uh, find, find the stress in the supports, so find the stresses, and find uh, the, the new position of the beam, so I guess we can call it bell of the entire beam, it's going to drop a little bit 
assuming that it remains level. So those are the, the things we need to find. Because if we do know this material, we know the elastic modulus, we're also going to know the yield stress, and we want to make sure we stay below that. So we do need to calculate the stresses. All right, so let's, uh, as we have on the other ones, at least begin with the statics we know as best we can. So we've got PA there resisting this load of 220 kilonewtons. We have PC and PB doing that for us. Yeah, maybe in your alphabet. Not in my new world alphabet. Okay. Can't even spell ABC. <laughs> Alright, there we go. All fixed. Thank you, Travis. It must be must be uh, Swiss rolls with ginkgo biloba in them. Alright, so the statics tells us. Let's see. Oh, by symmetry, we know PA equals PC. Comfortable with that? Uh, that would actually come from uh, the sum of the moments about point B, the middle. Um, but then we can also say uh, P, A, B, and C must equal 220 kilonewtons. So that's some help there. Um, then let's, uh, let's sum the moments about C. Because in this problem, we, we uh, expect there to be some, some moments. Maybe that can help. So if we sum the moments about C, we get uh, uh, PA. Unknown, we're looking for that. Once we find it, we can find the stresses. So we need the forces. PA times a meter and a half plus PB times 0.75 meters must equal 220 times 0.75 meters. That look okay for the moment? It's about C. got two equations, really only two unknowns because two of the forces are the same anyway. I could even rewrite this as uh, two PA, since PA and PC are the same, plus PV. That's just putting this one into that one. What's the trouble with these two equations we have here? We've got two unknowns, PA and PV. Why can't we just solve them? If we divide this equation by 0.75, we get this equation. So they're not independent. Uh, it was a noble effort. You were more than happy to write it down without protest. But uh, we got to do something else. Any suggestions? not independent. So we still need another equation. David? Delta A, B, and C should all be equal to delta yeah. B. Yeah, if the bar remains level, then each one of them must elongate by the same amount. So del A equals del B equals del C. 
uh, as required. That will give us then, actually, uh, the del A and del C equations are going to be the same, but that will give us another equation and uh, no, no extra unknowns. So uh, PA, they all have the same length, so I'll just call that L over E A A A. That will be the deformation of piece A. And the deformation of piece C is going to be exactly the same, so it won't be uh, an extra equation, but which what will be is the deformation of piece B. That will be an, uh, an independent part. So there's an independent equation independent of the first two, and we can solve the pieces then thereof. So what's left? Just the algebra that you love. Notice, even though we're talking about the deformations, the length of these pieces is immaterial. This will be the same solution no matter what. Because of this uh, constraint, that the bar remain horizontal. So solving for those last little bits, it's all algebra from here on out. This is where you hire your little brother to do it. We get the force in A, which we know to be equal to the force in C, because of symmetry, is 33 kilonewtons. And since those two together handle 66, then we know what's left over for B. It's uh, 154. So again, we needed our elastic deformation of the solids to give us enough equations to solve this problem. Now we can figure out what the stresses are, because we know what the forces are, we know what the areas are, we can figure out the stress in each of the pieces. I think I have those, you can double check them. Uh, 59.9 megapascals. And the stress in the middle one, it's got a different area, a different load, so it's going to have different stress. It's 171 megapascals. So most of the uh, most of the troubles in there, even though it has a greater area, has a lot more of the load. One thing we're not looking at yet that we will shortly is the fact that this beam itself would deflect. That there's, because these are elastic solids, uh, there's no way that can be avoided, but we're not taking that into account yet. We will look at the actual deformation of the beam itself as well as its displacement to get a uh, more accurate solution. <clears throat> it can certainly be that the, the solution is level, but to have the same deflection at A and C <coughs> that you do at B is not a realistic possibility, but is approximation that we're making still at this point. We'll handle that. Uh, <coughs> In April, we'll get to the actual bending of the beam itself by uh, cross loads, transverse loading like that. And the last little bit, you need to find the full deflection, how much the beam displaces, and that looks like one point, one point seven one millimeters. That's just uh, uh, 
answering these pieces right there. Find any one of them and you'll know the deflection of the hole because this itself guarantees that the beam stays level. All right, questions on that piece? We got 33 by just plugging in the numbers, solving for PA. Yeah. Oh, I don't know why those <coughs> became Fs. They should have been Ps. But that's just from uh, solving the, the two equations. We have two equations, two unknowns. PA and PB are the unknowns. PA and PB still the only two unknowns. So you solve these two equations, and you get these. And we already know PA equals PC. So the algebra on this one isn't even all that complex. And then you take those forces, of course, and divide by the respective areas to get the stresses. All right, questions? A lot of stress in this middle piece, even though it's got the greater uh, uh, modulus of elasticity and a much greater area. Okay, so we can start a problem for you. I've been earning my pay, but you guys have been slacking off, so you need something to do. We'll start a problem here that last fall we couldn't have done. So here's a beam supported by two struts evenly spaced, so each at about a third. One of them a lot longer than the other at a rigid support. And all to supply support for some load P here, we'll put at the end. So, evenly spaced struts at 50 inches apart. The longer one is 80 inches in length. The shorter one, 50 itself in length. Number of these. That's one and that's two. So L1 is 80 inches, L2 is 50. A1 is one inch squared, A2 is half an inch squared. with a half a square inch. They're both made of the same material. Ten times ten to the third KSI. Everybody know what a KSI is? kilopound per square inch. And for all of this, the stress in those pieces, they're all the same material, must be cut, kept below 30 KSI. Okay, that brings us right up to the end. So there's something for you to do over the weekend. You don't have homework in dynamics. So you've got, and you've got in a, a winter supply of uh, Swiss rolls. So you don't need to go out, get the dog sled out to go get them. So you find out the pieces. Now, uh, the trouble is that this maximum stress might come in one or the other, 
that makes one of them the limiting case. You might find that a large P in one of them will cause the other one to fail. So you have to look at both of them. And uh, again, you just have to use the very same type of things we've used before. You know, the beam will deflect, displace something like that. And you can use our deformation informations uh, to figure out uh, what those two will be uh, proportional to each other based upon the triangle that's, that's uh, made as they displace. So the statics would not allow you to solve this, but the uh, strength of material then <coughs> will allow you to solve it because you can figure out what the displacement is. Let me make sure I've got all the pieces for you there. Yeah, everything. You got everything you need, so you should be able to solve that with uh, the combination of statics and the strength of material. Mm -hmm.